sans plus tarder. Let's now move on to the last session of this uh, particular section. And we have uh, an exchange uh, between uh, Muni Hamajubi, who is uh, Secretary of State uh, for Digital Affairs, and Professor Latanya Sweeney. Please come up. You can Monsieur le Ministre, Minister, Professor Sweeney, thank you very much for being here today to talk to us about the societal impact of artificial intelligence. The first question that I'd like to put to you concerns data sharing. Mr. Minister, we know that data, after all, is what keeps artificial intelligence running. Therefore, processing data, using data, is going to become much more widespread. So what sort of legal framework, what sort of technical tool do we need to make sure that data is protected, perhaps in a smart way, in a better way? Do you think that the legal framework as it stands today is tight enough and protects us enough. Thank you, Celia. Well, I think there are two different sorts of data. There's personal data, but there's also non-personal data, industrial data, for example, which can have a public interest and could be uh, vitally important for our countries or societies. And in the months to come, that's going to be a major subject that we're going to be discussing. That is, is there data that should be made available to others? And I think this is something that we're going to be talking about. We talked about the health sector. We talked about transport. If uh, we were to go faster and innovate uh, in those areas, uh, well, then uh, it would have a greater impact on people's lives. Now, when we're dealing with this sort of data, we would say it's maybe not free data, but you might have to share them. Now, to come back to personal data, you have obviously the right to use and also the way in which information is shared. The GDPR is going to be introduced by the end of June. In in itself is a revolution because once it is actually passed and applied, we will have greater transparency. But the real revolution will be when uh, the right uh, to repatriate your data that each citizen has uh, will be applied. We've had many discussions on personal data, but the first problem when you're dealing with that is uh, the fact that ordinary individuals are not really that interested in their personal data. If people were to actually more aware of what personal data was, if you realize that it's not just a set of something, but it's an extension of yourself, and if one realized that that was important, then obviously one would be a little more demanding. So the GDPR is going to give us the tools. It's going to give us uh, the way to understand and learn it and tools. And then you can respond either through uh, NGOs, associations, or individually, or through um, the legal channels. Um, how many people have actually asked for their data to be repatriated online? Oh my God, that's 2% of the crowd here, and that is amazing. That's one out of 10. But usually, uh, there's only one or two hands that go up when I ask that sort of question. I ask this question many times uh, in every different fora. So the GDPR will make it possible uh, for us to have an open access uh, in a transparent manner, and it can also be uh, transported uh, to other services, but also uh, transportable to me or oh, myself. Now, once I've got the data, what can I do? I can keep it. I can uh, put it with something else, I can make it available to someone else, or I can decide, for example, to put it to somebody, give it to a community, which could put it in a sort of cloud, a package. There are lots of discussions about the right to her property. I think what is important is with this data is that uh, one should not actually sell it. Uh, so you shouldn't lose your property rights, uh, individual property rights, uh, but you could share it. So all of this is obviously uh, very important. Uh, but what I'm interested in and what the government's interested in is getting people to be aware of the importance of the data. 
Thank you. You have demonstrated the limits and weaknesses of mainstream data anonymization techniques. So what is your position and proposition on this main issue? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so we've done a lot of work over the last year, since the 1990s, showing how what we think is private data isn't. And even as late as now, uh, this year, we show how states in, in the United States and how federal governments are horrible at actually trying to protect privacy or anonymize the data that they share. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, some of it has to do with pol the policies themselves are very weak and there's no real incentive to use stronger protections. And other times, it's just simply there's just so much money in the data that it sort of warps the system. This idea of repatriating data and being able to get data under personal control is extremely powerful. Because at the end of the day, what's the real goal? The goal is to use your data to improve your life. We've been given a paradigm for the last 20 years or so that we have to share our data freely in order to get a service that improves our life. And recently that paradigm has shifted to now you have to buy a good some Internet of Thing device in order and give away your data in order to prove, improve your life. But that's not really how or why the technology works. You saw many great examples today about the power of the technology we have and the future of technology. What those examples don't describe, though, is what will that look like when it's packaged in a, within a business practice and made available to the public. It's that packaging of business goals along with the technology that led us to the paradigms we had before. The idea of repatriating your data means that you can have a paradigm shift. The technology is still available and still as powerful and able to help you. It's just, will the cost of using it be the cost being your data exposed widely or your data uh, shared more, shared and under your control. And, and once it's under your control, then a lot of the technologies that can do a better job at how you go about sharing your data so this is not an all or nothing proposition can come to bear. Okay. Um, Monsieur le Ministre. Um. Mr. Minister, when we look at what's happening in the news, particularly Cambridge Analytica, Analytica means that we have to look at data sharing more closely. Obviously, it's a way of innovating, but it's also a risk for individuals and for our society. So how are you looking at this? Are you uh, planning to look into this a little more closely in France uh, and in Europe? or even uh, worldwide on these basic issues. I think what Professor Sweeney said is uh, actually partially answers your question. And I think it's a very important question. Once people become aware of the subject, there's another phenomenon which is interesting, and that is competition. And that is uh, that uh, there's going to be a competition not only on the price uh, and the design uh, quality, but also on respecting privacy. But as long as consumers or users don't actually demand that, uh, it's not going to uh, happen. I could have three uh, options uh, for car hires. Uh, one will be the cheapest, one will be uh, probably not that uh, cheap, but uh, the drivers that you get uh, are really excellent and you get uh, really good uh, salaries and uh, they uh, do not save the data uh, for another time. But the chances of somebody actually going for the second option, which is more expensive but has all these other plus sides, uh, is not necessarily a given. And in the Cambridge Analytica story, I think apart from the technical side of things, apart from the current affairs side of things, I think what is important is the transparency and the consent issue. Obviously, I don't know how many times we've all clicked a little box that said that our data could be shared or could be sold, processed, recorded, saved, including 
conversations or her text messages. And we've always ticked that box. But did we really know what it meant? Did we really understand what it could entail? And if I had known that, would I have clicked that box or ticked that box in the same way? So I think one of our responsibilities is to make this regulation, the GDPR, really uh, be a living regulation that everybody can relate to. And we've got to make sure how that happens. With the GDPR, the idea is that you can be more specific in the consent that you give. So you can say, OK, I agree that you can collect my data, but I don't agree that you're going to sell it. Or I don't want this data to be collected or collated. Or I don't want uh, it to be shared with so-and-so. That's the sort of thing that will be possible. But obviously, we're going to have to be a little more careful because I don't think everybody has actually thought that it's going to be applied in that way, particularly the operators. So let us all be more alert and more careful. There are, of course, other issues as well. When you're dealing with artificial intelligence, uh, I mentioned this earlier on, uh, Kathy O'Neill talked about this, the fact uh, that algorithms uh, can actually have biases. On, on online ad delivery, you uh, established that Google AdSense service discriminates racially associated personal names on the web. Um, do these kinds of biases are pervasive on the web? And is there any sensible approach uh, to remove them for you? Yeah, one of the earliest, wow, that echoes right in your ear, <laughs> because I'm not speaking French. <laughs> um, yet. Yet, yes, I'm working on it, though. Uh, this is a slight detour. I just want to know, in the age of AI, I didn't have this when we first sat down. So I pulled up an app to do the translation. And you may not have realized it, but the first sessions were really talking about peanut butter and balloons. Um, <laughs> Whereas this uses a real human to tell me what's actually being said. So change is needed. Um, so in the early study that I did showed that uh, if you Googled a, a name that was who's for a pers of a person whose first name was given more often to black babies than white babies, you got ads suggesting they had an arrest record, even if no one with that name had an arrest record. This put, um, this put many uh, blacks at a disadvantage in employment situations because when you apply for a job, one always check, employers tend to check online to see what information is about you. And the implication that you have an arrest record uh, really did cause a situation where you could just be removed from consideration early. Google no longer provides those ads, but th that kind of content can be found elsewhere on the internet quite readily, and we had great examples of that when I was at the Federal Trade Commission. The, in some ways, that simple experiment and those results sort of foreshadowed what was to come re in the last, what, what is the state now? And that is basically a situation where there's so much data on all of us, so readily available, not just in one repository like Facebook that one company can exploit, but just you know, on the dark web through breaches and so forth and so on, that individuals and bots can, are systematically targeting us for other kinds of ads to manipulate us either economically or politically. And we certainly have witnessed the uh, improvement of these bots over time, and the more that a, the more is known about you, or the more the bot knows about you, the more you'll trust them, and the more you trust them, the easier it is to be exploited. So this has ramifications that are huge, not just in our personal life, not just uh, in our individual autonomy, but also in our societies at large, being held up for uh, divisive communications purposely trying to instigate and cause unrest. So I think this issue about personal data sharing is really large. And um, I do hope that the GDPR and new technical solutions will emerge so that we can all uh, live a better life and enjoy these technologies. Uh, thank you. Um, Monsieur le Ministre, le, le rapport... Uh... Minister, the Villani report the Villani report 
has suggested when facing these sort of risks that one should have an algorithmic audit and also to have a group of experts dealing with this, supervising this. Do you think that's the right thing to do or should we go further? Well, I think it's indispensable to raise this question and that is not really to be able to explain everything but at least to be able to understand some of these issues. Uh, algorithms, of course, uh, are going to help us, uh, give us support uh, in our decision-taking process. But sometimes uh, they can have an influence on the sort of information that I have access to, the way in which that information is presented. Now, th there are also cases uh, where uh, the algorithm can just give us a little bit support. There are laws that cover all three options. Uh, for example, uh, there are certain laws uh, that oblige uh, an operator uh, to transparently explain how the information was obtained. It's uh, the question that we said, that little uh, click on why. For example, if you go onto eBay, you get a whole lot of explanations about uh, how uh, the object was actually put on that site uh, for sale. So it, we want the same sort of thing, transparency on the date, on who's put the object up for sale or whatever. The, it's not actually implemented everywhere, even though this particular law does exist. And I'm sure that in the weeks ahead and the months ahead, it, especially with the GDPR, it will be applied. But secondly, how do you check we don't have a open source obligation. We don't really know from each algorithm platform. Sometimes uh, it's uh, really uh, something that comes up because people say, look, this has such a huge impact on our lives, uh, so we have to know. Others say, uh, well, look, let's find tests. And using her tech technology, let's find a way of auditing her, the algorithm without knowing the code. Lots of people are doing research uh, in this area. And the idea is to find the right sort of tools uh, that will allow uh, a human to understand how an algorithm is operating. If you just put um, an expert uh, uh, and ask an expert uh, to do uh, this or deal with this, actually he or she will not be able to cope with um, the huge uh, algorithms uh, and the complexity of them. But with these other tools, uh, we should be able to get them. So it's very important. We've got to find what's missing in the gaps uh, where they're that exist. Uh, for the time being, we don't have the tools uh, that allow us to do this. But we're setting up these obligations concerning uh, the criteria. As you said, uh, uh, Professor, obviously, if I had a big Y click uh, that I could click, a button that I could click, that would be something. But if I uh, just say uh, I've got some data on you, but um, if through the Y I also find out I've discovered that you like a certain thing. Uh, and so I know uh, that based on your personal data, I will be able uh, to uh, gear you or push you into that direction. Well, then obviously I'd be much more worried about it. Um, Professor Sumi, the, the Villain Missions has identified the issue of explicability that you told uh, Mr. Uh, Minister uh, of uh, machine learning algorithms as a major ethical concern. Um, to address this, uh, I think they recommend to heavily invest on explainable IA research. Um, for you, what role does the research community as us um, should play in these issues of fairness, accountability and transparency of uh, algorithms? Well, I mean, first of all, how do you know about harm until, until way late in the process? How do you know that you're being harmed individually? Um, a lot of times decisions are made about you what offers you'll get for credit cards or not, what job offers you'll get and so forth, all determined by algorithms. And so an inability to know uh, that you've actually been harmed is a real problem. Right now, there are, in the absence of policy that sort of forces a kind of accountability or forces more transparency, all you have are the researchers who take on the role of saying, what are the unforeseen consequences? How is this thing, how could this go wrong? And even researchers are often hampered because of a lack of an ability to say, I want to look inside this black box and see what's going on. 
Or what data did you use to train this black box? And is that data a bias? Or is the problem a selection function around the way the algorithm is being used? So all three of these, all three of these places are ways that bias can come into an algorithm that are very difficult to know, and if we have to wait until the harm happens, then we're left sort of in this sort of crisis moment. So the research community, it's really important to be able to do this, but that's kind of a marriage with policy, either enabling this idea that if you're using an AI for decision making, you know, this sort of dovetails off of what Kathy O'Neill said, then there should be a kind of warranty and it should be a kind of compliance statement, a warranty that this algorithm does what it says it does, and a compliance or a proof that it doesn't do other harms, that it harmonizes with the laws that you already have. If it doesn't do that, is there a way that research, or if, it, if it's claimed to do that, researchers also need to be able to test it. So it could be the case that the training data is biased, in which case a researcher would need access to the training data on which the algorithm was based. It could be that the algorithm itself has biases, and so to what extent can you either test it as a black box or peek inside? And then sometimes it is that selection process. So for example, in the, uh, in the case of the ads that we talked about, when, this, when the story first came out about the finding, the company said, oh, it's not us, it's the way in which Google rewards advertising delivery. That is, they get paid by what you click, and so their algorithm is trying to optimize which ad to deliver to which, which audience solely based on which one it thinks it will click. The advertiser claimed that they had put down ads on all the names of all adult Americans, and that they had put just as many suggesting arrests as neutral, and that the fact that it showed up, the arrest that showed up for blacks more often was because people, the society was clicking black ads, uh, arrest ads when searching for black names. Later at the FTC, we found that that may not really be what happened, but uh, irregardless that that wasn't the situation in that example, this idea of the bias of any learning algorithm that's going to adapt reminds us that we also have to be able to test for that. And those are places that the research community play big roles. Thank you. Um, Monsieur Minister, uh, Minister, we have a clear understanding now of what science can do and what scientists uh, can do to help. So my question is, uh, how will France uh, pick up the mantle? All the proposals uh, that are being made today, how can therefore France uh, also work in this area? France and Europe have a clear role how to play. We've talked about this many times this morning, and I think you've seen this uh, quite clearly. Our role is really how to concentrate on values. Um, and, uh, the impact uh, that uh, AI will have in our lives uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, something which uh, is uh, obviously uh, understood and being studied uh, all over the world. But in France, we have a high level of expertise and a high level of uh, understanding of values. So research has to come out of France. We have to find that the right sort of tools uh, that come out uh, are really something that correspond to what Europe and France stands for. That is uh, highly sophisticated from a technical point of view, but also uh, representative of our values. This is uh, what the Minister for Education said earlier on. This is what we will continue to strive for. And I will, uh, of course, work on that. And now, obviously, we have a French way of doing things, a European way of doing things, which will be different and which will probably just feed into the international discussions on the subject. And it will show us that it is possible to combine her both sides uh, quite uh, uh, satisfactorily. Inter AI her will, in fact, correspond her to those, uh, will have the profiles, in a way, of those who are actually developing it. <clears throat> and if we don't have good uh, balance, uh, whether it's social or racial, well, then it's that something that's going to be her feel. And we can say that AI, the way it's being developed, uh, is a bit like a large corporation. And uh, at the end of the game, we realize uh, that there is discrimination, there is bias, uh, there are recruitment 
techniques or methods uh, that are not quite fair? Well, tools or methods can be used to correct that. So I think the same sort of tools uh, that we use uh, in human resources or elsewhere can probably be used uh, as well in AI and understand how that these biases uh, or discriminations exist. Uh, so we should monitor the deviations, uh, monitor uh, these uh, slippages and try and correct them. And I think uh, that uh, this is something uh, which uh, would allow us uh, uh, probably uh, to uh, manage things better. Because uh, we can say uh, that um, learning her techniques uh, in her artificial intelligence are very similar uh, to what we can find in other parts uh, in other large corporations. So we should work along those lines. Thank you very much.